What does this go till 2? 2.15? Yeah, 2.15. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that won't be bad. I couldn't think of a witty remark to that. <laughs> Plenty of seats up, up front if you're, uh, <laughs> yeah. if you're late, you got to sit in the front. All right, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for coming. It's the after lunch session, so hopefully I won't put you to sleep. And hopefully I don't fall asleep in the middle of this presentation. Uh, so we're going to talk about applying data warehouse techniques and what that means. And uh, uh, just show of hands, who in here is kind of you know, working with a data warehouse or, or starting a project to build a data warehouse? All right, oh wow, this is, all right, great. So you're, hopefully you're in the right spot. So we'll talk a lot about how you structure the data when you're uh, loading data in there, how you, why you want to structure it that way, and um, we'll just kind of talk about the techniques behind that. Uh, it's a pretty open forum, you know, if you want to ask a question in the middle of the presentation, you know, feel free to ask, stop me, I'm pretty informal, I don't, I don't want to, you know, if you got a question, ask it, so. And I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, so me, I'm Spencer Swindell. I, uh, Live here in Nashville. I was born and raised here in Nashville, so that's pretty cool. You know, one of the few. Uh, so I went to Tennessee Tech, did a degree in computer science. Uh, came back to Nashville and immediately started working. I worked at Assurian for about a year and a half or so, and then I hopped around Nashville and landed at a firm called Think Data Insights, which was then bought by LBMC about a month ago, and so now we're LBMC Data Insights. And uh, so what we do, we partner with, uh, with with companies to help them build out their data platform, help them leverage the data that they have in house and help them uh, visualize that, usually through Power BI or some other form of visualization. Uh, we're Microsoft Gold Partner, so we do a lot with uh, the Microsoft stack, a lot building services out in Azure and uh, building out the warehouses there. Um, so I've been doing this for a little while, um, so hopefully I have something that I can share with you guys. Uh, my Twitter is very creative. It's at Spencer Swindell. Uh, feel free to follow me. The great thing about following me on Twitter is I don't tweet a lot. Uh, so. I won't blow up your news feed with stupid stuff. Although I did tweet Cookie Monster this morning. Uh, he said that he was what he eats. Or he, um, I messed that up. He said that uh, he took a DNA test and that he was 100% cookie. And I said he is what he eats. Um, I got a two-year-old man. Sesame Street's my life right now. All right. Uh, there's my email. That's my personal email. You can have it. You can email me all you want. Uh, and then there's my blog, mytwospence.com. There's one blog article on it. And uh, I'll eventually write a second one. That means I won't. Uh, so I worked with LBMC uh, for, I guess, a month now. Um, and they're great. They do a whole lot of stuff, like a ton of stuff, like so much stuff. Uh, so much stuff that we just can't even talk about it all because they do so much stuff. It's mostly tax and audit, uh, financial services, things like that. Uh, uh, we, we do have a, a section of the group that does an IT org that uh, handles, you know, uh, sort of consulting on the IT side as well as the cybersecurity uh, division that does some cybersecurity uh, uh, consulting, and then we have our group now, the Data Insights group, that does analytics. Uh, so we can serve quite a few uh, needs that you might have. All right, so we're going to talk first about the value of a data warehouse and kind of why you want to build one. Uh, most of you guys are already working on one, so you might already know the answer to this question or, or get it. Uh, but if you're working in an organization, you might have data that's spread out across a number of different systems. It might be that uh, you're, you're cloud-based, and so you've got maybe some data sitting in Azure, but then you use a lot of different software as a service solutions for uh, uh, different facets of your business. And so you might have data in those different uh, systems, things like Salesforce, but um, I'll give you an example. You could have some data in Shopify for maybe a member program. We've got a, a client that uh, they're a restaurant group, and so they've got data. As soon as you walk in the door, you give them your name and your phone number. That goes into a third-party system that uh, we then have to get data out of. So all this data is in different parts or pieces of, of your business. And there's no way to really bring that data together into a unified view. Uh, and so what we end up having to do is sort of take the data from all these different places, ETL it or extract, transform, load it into sort of a centralized repository 
the data warehouse. We're gonna structure it and model it, and then we're gonna have some way of viewing that data through like a Power BI or a Tableau, uh, Looker, or pick your, pick your tool at that point. Um, and so, so, so really the point is here, we wanna analyze data across all these different places. We need a place to sort of store all that data in a single repository. And that's what the data warehouse is, okay? Uh, so you might come up with something at, at first that looks something like this. This is a small, simple solution architecture, just fancy word for, you know, pictures with lines. Uh, so we might have some, maybe you're looking at like employee data from your Office 365 instance, maybe you got stuff in SharePoint lists, or maybe you're trying to pull data out of Active Directory. Maybe you've got uh, some Excel files that are just sitting around in your organization that maybe your business runs on Excel. <coughs> that happens. Uh, maybe you've got data out in a, a uh, web app, or maybe you build, um, maybe you're microservices and you've got data in a whole bunch of different data platforms, Mongo or SQL Server. Um, but what we're gonna do usually, what ends up happening, is we'll take data from these different sources, we'll end up using a tool like Data Factory, or um, you know, this could be SSIS if you're on-prem or using a tool like that. I think for AWS it's something called Blue, or there are different tools out there to use. To pull data from those sources, we're gonna load it into a warehouse, usually in some sort of staging environment, and then we'll transform that data into uh, what we'll call a dimensional model, and I'll explain what that is in a second. And then we'll use something like analysis services maybe to pull that data into memory, write calculations on top of it, and then use Power BI to present on that. And what that, that analysis services does there is it allows for a single unified view of your data. So no matter who's looking at the data, it's all being calculated the same exact way. Uh, so it might be something simple like that. If you're more modern and cool, this is from Microsoft. This is the Microsoft Modern Data Architecture. Uh, still same kind of story. You've got data that's sitting out here somewhere in your uh, environment somewhere, and you're gonna use Data Factory to pull that data in, and then that thing is really bright, my God. Uh, get blinded. Uh, you're gonna pull data out with Data Factory, and then you're gonna load it into maybe a data lake or something, and you're just setting it there, and eventually you can come back to it with a very uh, wide variety of different tools to come pull that data. Maybe you're doing some machine learning modeling off of that, uh, or maybe you're just using something like Azure Databricks, which is really just Spark to transform that data and then load it back into the data lake or maybe it's piping it directly into say uh, a data warehouse. So like this is Azure SQL data warehouse, it's a distributed database platform. Could be something like Amazon's Redshift, similar tool. Snowflake is another one, it's just like it. Uh, Terra, uh, what was the one, uh, Terra, Terra data, there you go, thank you. You get up here and you start talking, you can't think. Uh, but then you might still use something like analysis services and Power BI or another tool to, um, to pull that data out. So does that make sense to everyone? This is familiar stuff? All right, good. Uh, so, so I wanna talk for a second a little bit about um, kind of the application side of it. Uh, when, when you have an application database, say it's a, a monolith, but it's maybe something like Dynamics GP or something like that where it's your accounting system, right? And that's where a lot of your financial data is at and you wanna get that data out. It's not really, a good place to do analytics for a number of reasons. The biggest reason being that's your operational system by going out and hitting it with some analytical query, because maybe you're just running that query, you're pulling that data out and putting it in Excel, because maybe you're a small shop and you don't have a lot of tools yet to do things with. Uh, that, that, that old TP system, the way that data is structured, the way the tables are laid out is usually a normalized <laughs> fashion. What's gonna happen is that, that's not really optimized well for analytics. It's really optimized for single row transactions or just a few rows, tens of rows in terms of the, the amount of uh, uh, workload that you're putting on that server at a time, right? So you can do a lot of transactions, a lot of different you know, people hitting it at the same time, but they're just hitting small bits of the data. When you come in and you wanna look at sales over the past year and then compare it to this year, uh, you're gonna be scanning entire tables worth of data, you're gonna bring that up into memory and you're gonna just really throw out the cash. And what can happen is you're gonna interrupt your operational uh, uh, workload or your operational uh, processes that are going in Place, right? Have you ever done that? You're throwing a select star query at a table and then all of a sudden people are complaining that, hey, the system's really slow. Has that ever happened? Yeah, okay. If that hasn't happened, ha haven't happened to you yet, you haven't lived. Uh, so anyways, um, what we wanna do instead is have uh, what we'll call an OLAP system, an online analytical processing system. And all that means is that uh, we're gonna take that data, we're gonna extract it out of that source, just as I said before. We're gonna land it in a warehouse and we're gonna structure it a little bit differently. So when I wanna do that scan of data over the last year compared to this year, uh, it's a much more efficient query. Okay. Any questions? Am I talking too fast? Okay, I feel like I'm talking too fast. Uh, so, 
just to, to hound this point a little more, I've got a quick demo uh, using SQL Server here that I'll show. Uh, oh, if I don't close it. Uh, so I've got two queries here. This is uh, running on Microsoft SQL Server. Um, so if you don't like Microsoft, that's too bad. Uh, the top one here is a data warehouse query, uh, and the bottom one here is, is, a, is a query that gives the same results, but it's based off the, uh, the old TP version of the database, okay? And so this is just using Microsoft's Wide World Importer database. It's like their sample database. You can go get it for free. Uh, and so we're gonna look at these two queries, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run them uh, side by side, and I'm gonna pull back an execution plan, where the execution plan is whenever you send that text off to the SQL Server, it's gotta parse that text out and figure out what you're trying to do. It then creates this thing called an execution plan, and that's the steps to actually pull the data out, process it, and then send it back to you. Okay, and so there's steps involved with that, and the way it uh, figures out how to do it, it's a cost-based system of doing that, and so what I'm basically gonna show you here is that this guy is gonna cost less than this guy. Okay, so we're gonna run that. And if I look at these two plans, we'll see here the first one well, if I don't have the thing blocking it, we'll see that this one took 35% of the, uh, relative to the batch, the batch being the two queries. The top one was 35% of it, the bottom one, as you can do some math, 65%. Uh, there. Okay. And so just looking at these two queries real quick, all I'm doing here is I'm just grabbing, uh, Starting up at the top here with this select, I'm getting sales territory, I'm getting basically a total, uh, total sales by sales territory, all right? So I'm pulling that from my orders table, I'm joining out to a city, to, a city table that has all the city information, that's where my sales territory is coming from. I've got a dimension that's a date dimension, and what I'm doing is I'm filtering on my fiscal year of fiscal year 2016, so I have a label in my data specifically for that. And then I just group by and I do a little ordering, nothing. Nothing crazy, pretty straightforward query to follow, right? Well, an application query is still the same kind of thing, but I'm doing a lot more work because I'm having to join out some more tables. What I've done here is the cities is what we'll call a normalized table, meaning I've taken this data and I've split it out into multiple tables. What that does is reduce my overall cost of storage for, those, for that data. Uh, but that comes at the price of when I query it, I gotta join it all back up together, right? So it saves on storage, but it's a cost on processing time, right? And so, what I'm doing here, I've, I've got to calculate my total sales up here, because uh, I don't already have that pre-calculated for me. And so if this is a more complicated, uh, a more complicated uh, measure, say like it's a per 100,000 metric, uh, this can happen in healthcare, where you have uh, one person wants to split days out on a, third per, on a 30 day basis per month, but then someone else wants to use a little bit more of a realistic where it's you know, 30, 31, 30, 31. Uh, days, you get up, you end up with two different answers for the same metric, right? But here I have to define my metric, and then I also have to define what my fiscal year is. Here is between uh, July and June. Um, you know, if, you, if for fiscal year that might be a pretty simplistic example, but if you have to define what your filter is every single time, right? Uh, that can be pretty annoying. It's nice to just have a single label that you can just filter on. So the query is just a little bit more complicated to write here. It's a little bit more to deal with, a little bit more of um, tribal knowledge, if you will, of knowing how to filter data, how to do the calculation, as opposed to just seeing it and you know, being able to work with it. Okay, all right, so back to the slides. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. All right. <clears throat> It's almost 1.30 if you guys want to leave, you know, you said that you could, all right, hey, all right, good deal. Okay, so, uh, so we're gonna talk the rest of this talk about what's called the dimensional model. And so the dimensional model is really just the way we want to store data in this OLAP or data warehouse uh, model or this uh, database. Uh, and so this was popularized by a guy named Ralph Kimball. He wrote a book on it called The Data Warehouse Toolkit. I highly recommend going and reading it. Um, it's a great way to fall asleep. Uh, it, is, it is a bit of a dry read, but it's very good information. And it's uh, also information that's really stood the test of time, meaning that uh, it, it, it's, I think the original version was written in the 80s or 90s or so, and it's still, the, the, the ideas and the principles still hold true today, today. So it's really stood the test of time in terms of ideas of how to store data in this manner. And it really even applies today in the sort of the modern data warehouse world where you have these data lakes where you store data, but then eventually you wanna be able to, to, to visualize that data and present on it and, 
at some point you are going to want to put some kind of structure around it, especially if you're using something like a Redshift or a SQL Data Warehouse. And, and using this, this, uh, these techniques um, will optimize that greatly. And when you optimize that, that's going to reduce costs, and we'll get into all that here in a second. Uh, so in the dimensional model, we really we split our data into two different types of tables. Uh, and I like to call these the nouns and the verbs of your business. And so the dimension tables are what we'll call the nouns, and they're the attributes or the descriptors that define different um, entities within your business. And so you could think of this like your customer. It could be something like a geography. It could be uh, a facility where you do business at. It could be uh, employees or managers. Um, what else did I put up there? Oh, a product. It could be a product, too. And then uh, <laughs> fact tables are the other side of that. They're your verbs. And these are the business processes that you're trying to measure, the business events that you want to measure. And so for there, the, the fact tables, what they'll end up doing is they'll be highly normalized. They'll point out to the dimension tables, which hold all the descriptive information. And then they'll just be nothing but a bunch of integers. And we'll see this in a second. Nothing but a bunch of integers that, that are really, uh, ideally, you know, integer four bytes uh, per integer. And if I can compress that row size, I can put more data into a page on disk. And when I read that stuff up into memory, I'm getting more throughput on my I.O. I can fit more data into memory. I can get more utilization out of my overall system. Right? So uh, the fact tables themselves, uh, this could be something like sales or a patient visit into a hospital. Um, so if you think like if you go to Lowe's and you buy something at Lowe's and we all know we can only, can't buy more than one thing at Lowe's, right? Uh, you go in for light bulbs, you come out with a ladder. So, didn't happen to me. Uh, anyways, uh, that was a bad joke. Uh, so, <laughs> you get a receipt when you leave, right? And on that receipt, you'll see, you know, you buy a light bulbs, battery, uh, some grass seed, right? Or whatever it is you bought at Lowe's. Um, each of those lines, those item lines, right? If you, you can almost translate it, that into a fact table where you're going to have a sales items table that is one row for each item that was sold. And there will be some quantity of how many units of it did you sell, and then what was the price at which you sold it at, that kind of stuff. And then the descriptor type information on it would be what store did you buy it at, who was the employee that rang you out, what was the product identifier that, that you bought, um, and all that's going to sort of be on that fact table. And so it's going to give you sort of the complete picture of that event or that business process that happened. Right? Same thing with patient visit in a hospital. It could be that you have a patient, so that might have a dimension key to a patient. You might have a facility. Uh, it's a key to a facility. It might be a provider that they visited with. There's going to be an admission date. There'll be a discharge date. Both of those would go to a, say, a calendar dimension. Uh, and you'll have all that information there. And then you might compute the difference between the admit date and the discharge date to get a link to stay. Right. Makes sense? Okay. So dimension tables, nouns, descriptors, uh, attributes of your business entities, fact tables, verbs, the, uh, the, the processes, the, the events that you want to measure. Okay. And so I spoke a little bit how the fact tables are very normalized and compact. And when we build them that way, that gives us scalability, right? Because I can fit more rows into that table and be performant. It's uh, the, the performance is there because the query, uh, looking at going back to the example that I just showed, usually you're selecting data from a fact table, joining to some dimension table, uh, the, the, uh, maybe multiple dimension tables, doing some aggregate and grouping by some data. Uh, Database platforms are, are optimized for that kind of a query, or can be optimized for that kind of a query, and that leads to more performance. So it's a little bit more, you can expect it, right? Uh, and also simplicity, right? The model's sort of pre-built for us. A lot of that semantic layer is kind of defined up front. And so when you start to see that data, things uh, just kind of make sense and it flows through. Okay. Oh, and then uh, since we're transforming that data, I should note that really the ETL is about 70%, 70, 80%-ish. Of, of, of uh, projects, so you may be that extracting data out of these different places. Uh, maybe you've got to write a parser to parse a, a specific file format. Maybe you've got to connect to some API to pull data. All that work is going to end up being 80% of the work. The modeling is pretty straightforward. Once you define the model, you just build the tables and you're done. Uh, it's it's the, the ETL that's the larger portion of the work. Okay. Um, so you don't have to take my word for it on this dimensional modeling stuff. Uh, if you read this white paper from the guys at Microsoft, it says that the Kimball model is basically the the most performant way to deal with uh, what's called an analysis services tabular model. If you're using Power BI underneath the hood, it's just analysis services tabular. Okay. So you, can, you can go find that uh, white paper. It actually was written in 2012, um, but for the most part, that, that product has stayed the same. There's been some changes to it um, in terms of how you can get data, but for the most part, it's, it's the same idea. Okay. Uh, so dimension tables. This screenshot might be a little small for the people in the back. 
um, but it's just a picture of a, of a ge geography table. Really, it's I've got a row here for each postal code, uh, and then uh, I've got a place, a state. All that is flattened out into a single table. And so if you look at something like the state or the state abbreviation or the, uh, the place name, that information is repeated down. It's denormalized. Uh, I'm incurring a storage cost for that, but what happens is my dimension tables are my smallest tables in my model. Uh, so I don't really care about repeating this information when the whole table is only 10,000 records, or maybe it's 100,000 records. It's really small. It's not a lot of data to work with. Uh, so I can, I can handle that cost because what's going to happen is I can just join to this one table in my query. I've got all the data there that I need. I don't have to go join to multiple tables to get to something that I need. Okay? Um, now, one thing that I do here is I also create a, a, in this case, it's the geography key. It's called a surrogate key. The surrogate key really on its own holds no value. Uh, it's really tied more to, in this case, the postal code. The postal code is sort of the, um, what we'll call the business key to the dimension. So as incoming data is being loaded in, we'll use this postal code as sort of the way to, to match up records from the source system. But the surrogate key is what's used within my model. Because what I can do is say this postal code, in this case I've got leading zeros there, so that's a, I can't store that as an integer because uh, it'll get rid of the leading zeros, right? And it's not going to match up with the system and it's going to get weird. I got to write code to fix it up. I don't want to have to do that. Um, and so this is going to end up being stored as a, as in this case a bar card probably five, uh, or character five. I don't want to use um, character data as my key, because the fastest way to, to, join, to join two tables is based on an integer join. Because what happens is underneath the hood, right, you just do a subtraction. If it's zero, they're equal. If it's, if it's a, a string and I've got to compare it, I've got to look at each character and figure out, make sure they're all the same. And so it's just more operations under the hood. <laughs> you guys, yeah. So. That's what you get out of taking an assembly class in college. Anyways, so, so geography key, I've got that there, and that's going to relate back to my fact table. Okay? Any questions on that? Some people will like to skip the surrogate key part, um, but what I'll show here in a second is uh, we use that. Uh, it's more important as we want to preserve history in our dimension tables. And so bringing up preserving history, there's a couple different ways we can store data into a dimension table, and we've sort of categorized these into a couple different types. Uh, so type one is just, uh, I have a dimension, I have new data that's coming in, maybe some of that data is already in the dimension, but maybe some of the attributes have been updated, uh, maybe a new product category or description is filled in. Uh, we just overwrite that data. I don't care about preserving history in a type one dimension, okay? In a type two dimension, I want to preserve that history, and so what I do is I keep that old row, when I got that new row with the new data, uh, I, I, what I'll do is I'll terminate, I have a begin and end date on a, on a row, I'll terminate the row, I'll insert a new row underneath, and it'll get its own primary, or its own surrogate key. And so what happens is I get two different surrogate keys for really the same sort of entity, but one's sort of the old version, one's the new version. Fact data from before that's currently existing in my fact, data's, fact tables will point to that original record, and then uh, any new data that comes in will point to the new data. And so when I slice out by that, that, that say we'll, we'll call it a product category that changed, uh, the data splits out accordingly. It's not all retroactively fitted to that data. Does that make sense? I got an example of that. We'll, we'll walk through some, some scripts here in a second. Type three, a little more rare. Um, if my data updates once a year, maybe I just add a column and I grow it out uh, horizontally as opposed to vertically. And then uh, we skip five and four and we go right to six because one plus two plus three is six. Um, that was a joke. And, and that's really a combination of all three of these techniques. Uh, but you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump over to a demo real quick, and we'll walk through this uh, script. And so that is not the, that's not the one I wanted to show you. So we're going to open up this guy. All right. Uh, so I have, uh, we're going to pretend that we're going to load an employee dimension, and the employee dimension is going to be a type 2 dimension. Okay? Pretty, pretty easy stuff. So we're going to pretend that this first table here is a uh, sort of our, we'll call it source employee data. So maybe this is a staging table where you get some employee data out of uh, either Workday or Ulti Pro or whatever system you use. I want to just dump it down into this system, okay? So I'm going to create that table, and then I'll create my dimension table. And so you'll see here, here's my actual dimension table. It's going to be a type 2 dimension. I'm using a, uh, a couple things here. First off, the employee key is just an identity column. There's nothing special about that. If you're working real hard to generate surrogate keys, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and then I've got an effective date and a termination date. Okay, and 
So that'll tell me when this row is sort of considered valid. And then we're going to load some data into source employee. And so we got Ken, who was our owner. We got David, the CTO. We got Aaron, the consultant. And we've got me, the architect. Uh, and so just so there's no uh, craziness, there's, there's the data in the table. So it loaded. Okay. And so I've got a, a load procedure here for actually loading the dimension. So what might happen is I might use something like Azure Data Factory. I might take data out of that source system, load it into that stage table, and then I'll call the store procedure to finish loading the data into my warehouse. Right? And so what we'll do here is um, let me create it real quick, and then I'll walk through the steps on it. So what we do is uh, first create a, a little temp table here that we're going to load our changed records into, or the ones that have changed. So what I do is I first up, I, so I said when we get new data in, I'm going to terminate that old row and then insert a new one. So I need to terminate that old row, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the terminated date to basically before today, but you could change maybe how this is actually happening. Uh, but I'll join my employee domain, I'll, my employee dimension. I'll interjoin that up with my stage data that's coming in. And that just joins on this employee ID, and so that's our business key, right? And then I'm filtering it down to where my terminated date is 2199 December 31st. I'm hard coding that to that date. And if I use the null, it'd get a little tricky when you're trying to join things up. And this will break in 2200, but who cares? We'll all be dead. So that's a joke. And then I'll only change it if the title or the employee name change. I only care about tracking history on maybe these two columns. If you had like five, or maybe 500 would be a little extreme, but if you had say 20 columns here, instead of comparing all of those individual columns, you could just compute a hash and compare the hashes. That'd be a lot faster than string comparing all of those. Uh, but once I, I do that update, any records that I changed, I'm going to spit out that employee ID into this updated records uh, temp table. Okay? And I'll use that to know which records I need to reinsert into my table. Okay? And so here I've got uh, an insert statement. I'm going to insert into the employee dim two-part query here. So the first part is just identifying employees that I haven't loaded in yet. Maybe these are new hires. And so we'll load them into the table and then uh, we're going to union that with, I'll go back to my source table and interjoin anything that I changed. I'm going to reinsert those records. Right? So I'm going to get a new, new uh, key for those. Okay. All right, so I'm going to run this real quick. And then we'll see. Uh, there's my data. Right? And this is pretty straightforward. The, the surrogate key is actually matching up with the employee ID. All this data is right, pretty cut and dry. There's nothing really special going on here. Uh, but now we'll say, we'll pretend that our, our data uh, load ran and Aaron got promoted to a VP, which he did. And then uh, we hired this new guy, Jeff, and he does machine learning. Um, and so we'll see in our source system, maybe when I pulled it the next day, it looks something like this. I've got. Um, Aaron in here now, he's a VP, right? But I want to track history on that because he was a consultant before. Maybe I don't want to split, the, you know, if we, we track hours in terms of our workload, right? I don't want to have all of his work now suddenly become VP work because it was consultant work before. Maybe that's a poor example, but that's the idea. Um, so I'm just going to run my store procedure again. Nothing special here. And now I'll go look at my employee dim. And what we'll see here is... I've got Aaron in here on, on row three, but then I've also got him in here on row five, so I've got a new uh, sort of uh, version of him, right? And so I've got that with the effective and term dates set up, and so any rows that have that three key will point to his consultant record, any rows with the five will point to his VP record. Does that make sense? And then we added uh, Jeff in there, too. So. Okay. Pretty straightforward stuff. So. Uh, so that's the different ways we can store history. There are some other ways of handling um, dimensions. So let's say if you had a customer dimension, you got a million customers. You don't have to join a million row table up to your you know, 10 or 20 or 100 million row fact table every time you want to do an analysis on your customer. Maybe you got demographic data in there. Right? So what you can do is you can create this thing called a mini dimension. And what you're going to do is say for the example of a customer dimension, you can take some of the more demographic information out, maybe uh, age bracket, or uh, ethnicity, or um, any kind of demographic background information you might have, 
um, you can take that and sort of abstract it into its own dimension that's just those elements. And so if you just look at, a, at the cardinality of just those elements, you're probably going to look at like the order of a thousand records versus a million, right? And so you'll give that its own dimension, put its own key on it, put that key on the fact table, and then that way when you join to it, it's just a small table joining up to this larger table. And then you can use the customer dimension for like more detailed reporting if you wanted like names or addresses. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, a junk dimension is another uh, type of dimension we can use. It happens when you have a lot of like status columns or just small, uh, low cardinality values and what you can do kind of like with the mini dimension, you just sort of cross join all these up together, compute all of them and load that in. If that's a really small set, you can just do that once. Maybe you just look for new ones that come in and you can get a small thousand row table with one key as opposed to maybe 10 t tables putting 10 keys on your fact table, right? So this is a way to sort of reduce the number of keys on your fact table. It's called a junk dimension because you know you got that drawer in your house that you put everything in and then you can't open it up anymore. Well, the one that's got that drawer. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, the last one, or the next two here, degenerate dimension. Uh, I'll have a, a screenshot of one of those in a second. It's basically like uh, I, I did the Lowe's example, right? And you might have a sales ID along with that transaction. Uh, that sales ID is going to grow about as fast as your fact table because you're generating one about every sales transaction, right? Uh, so it doesn't make sense to abstract that into its own dimension when you can just store it on the table itself because you don't want to have to join, again, 200 million row tables together. That's going to be really slow, right? So we just leave it on the fact table. So it's degenerate. It doesn't get its own table. And then there's this last guy, role-playing dimension. It's basically the idea of I'm going to use a dimension multiple times within a business process. A great example is in a patient visit, you have an admit date, you have a discharge date. Those both tie to a calendar table or a date dimension, um, but they're, they're the same thing, right? But they're two different uh, ideas within your business process, okay? Same thing with like an employee or a manager. Um, there are other examples out there too, okay? Uh, Multi-value dimension. So what do you do when you have, um, you could have multiple values for a single instance in a business process. A great example is a diagnosis code. And so what do you do if you have, say, five or 10 or 20 diagnosis codes on one patient visit in a hospital? Uh, how, do you, how do you store that data? Uh, one option would be to have diagnosis code one, two, three, four, all the way to 20 or however many that you might think you need. Uh, but then you might not store them all. There might be some that fall off of that or Maybe that's just too many, right? We're having to create more rows or more columns on our fact table. That's more data per row, right? We don't want to have to store that. And so one method we can do is instead we can have a table that sits between the dimension and the fact table. We call that a bridge table. And what it's going to do is hold the unique combinations of, in this case, diagnosis codes, having a key for each one of those unique combinations. And that key will map up to the fact table. So one key on the fact table. Join it out to this table, this is a diagnosis code table that'll split it out into multiple rows, and then each row would have its own diagnosis key in that bridge table. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a mini to mini join there, um, which is a little complicated, and it can sort of change how you write your metrics on your table, um, but, but that's an effective way to do it. Okay. Uh, fact tables. Uh, so these are going to be your larger tables, right? And so the order of a million records to hundreds of millions, maybe a billion records. Um, we went to, I went to SQL Pass uh, in Seattle last year. Uh, they were demoing SQL Data Warehouse and they scanned a three trillion row fact table, or a trillion row fact table. And they scanned it in about six seconds. So that, that, uh, that uh, SQL Data Warehouse probably cost like you know, 10,000 bucks a minute or something. But uh, it, they did it, it was cool. Um, so in this case, it's gonna be uh, all your keys going out to your dimensions, right? And so you notice this is pretty much all integer data going across, right? And so the integer is really compact, four bytes per, per integer, right? So it's a really compact way to store that data. And then I've got this weird guy, this lone sequence number. Um, that's our degenerate dimension. He's just hanging out here because he's basically one for each row, right? And so I don't need to create its own dimension, right? Uh, so with the fact tables, we, we sort of do this thing, what we call declaring the grain of the table. And what that means is, what does one single row in the table represent? What I want to be able to do is for any column that I'm going to do some aggregate on, some summing, I want to just be able to write a query where I just sum up that column. I don't have to do anything special. I don't have to divide by how many uh, rows I had in the query or anything crazy like that. I just want to be able to sum up a column. It's called being additable. And so what I want to be able to do is define the grain such that I can just sum up, in this case for say a sales transaction, I can just sum up that, that unit amount right, or quantity sold or whatever it is and I get the right number. That number actually has meaning if I just total up the entire table. 
right? And so when I slice that out by dimensions, I can just keep that same metric and it'll still apply. So that gets tricky uh, when you're dealing things with like bank accounts or inventory levels where you might have, um, say, a weekly inventory level uh, that, that you match up on, but you wouldn't really sum that column up because it's, it's really a current state, right? And so maybe take an average or something like that on it. And so that's, that sort of gives you an idea of what to watch out for. And the grain will also sort of define at what level of detail you can see data at. And ideally, you want to get it as granular as possible. Uh, so in the case of, of the Lowe's example, right, you have a sales table that's at a row for each item that's sold. You can then see what items were sold, right? But if you had it just at that overall check level, you wouldn't be able to see what items were sold without some Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so fact tables, there's a couple different... I guess we'll call them types of fact tables. The most common one is just a transactional fact table, and that's where just where you get data that uh, comes in, and you load it into your fact table, and then you never really have to revisit it. It's sort of a once and done business process. The sales items is, a, is another good example of this, where you go into Lowe's, you make your purchase, you leave, you're done. There's no, the only revisiting of that is if you do a return, and even then that's its own business process. You create its own fact table for that kind of stuff. Uh, so in this case, you just load the data in once, you don't have to revisit it. Another type here is a periodic snapshot, and that might be on some specific interval, some period. Uh, you will take a snapshot of the table, you might sum it up or aggregate it to a certain level, and then load it in uh, to its own table. And what you get is sort of a snapshot history over time, and you can trim that. Right? And that gets tricky with sort of the additable columns, being able to make sure that you can just sum properly, properly on a column. Uh, the last one here is accumulating snapshot fact table, and that's if you have some, uh, say, a pipeline where someone will come in, and sort of go through multiple stages throughout. Uh, patient visit's a good example, right? Someone comes in, they admit into a hospital, they get that admit date and, uh, you know, who the patient is, what the facility, what insurance they have, and then eventually, maybe it's a couple days later, you get the rest of the information, what diagnosis were, were, did they get, uh, what was their discharge date, that kind of stuff. So with accumulating snapshot fact table, we're accumulating data, we're gonna come back to those rows and revisit them and update them with new information. All right, uh, and so something I didn't talk about. Uh, so fact tables, right, they're mostly integer data. Uh, in SQL Server, there's a great um, uh, indexing strategy for these uh, called column score indexing. And so what this gives you is uh, typically data in, in any database system is stored row by row. I shouldn't say any database. Most relational database systems will store that data row by row. You almost think of it like a CSV in that it's all just sort of plopped on there, sort of very rectangular. Um, if I have a 20 column table and I query it and only need five of those columns, it's got to go read all 20 columns off a of disk, load them into memory, and then filter down to just the five columns that I need, right? But if I uh, put something like a column store index on it, what this does is it sort of orients the data in terms of columns. So for that 20 column table, I query five columns. I'm only going to pull five columns off a of disk so I get better throughput on my I.O. And then uh, it's really good for aggregating data. And it can... Um, it can compress the data a lot better. It can basically take a distinct list of the, the, the data in a single column and compress it down to that. And it sort of has to restitch the data to sort of recreate the row. Does that make sense? Uh, so it's a great way uh, to do that. That's how Redshift stores data natively. That's how SQL Data Warehouse stores data kind of by default. Um, really great for partitioning data out and spreading it out across a cluster of machines. There's an open file format called Parquet. That's all column store. That's all column column or storage uh, for that. If you're using um, Azure, or sorry, Azure Analysis Services or SQL Server Analysis Services, Tabular, that's the backbone of Power BI, it's gonna store data in a column or format. So it's really fast at doing those aggregations and doing those calculations, okay? And so when you put all this together and you put it in a diagramming tool and you turn your head sideways and it's kind of squint a little bit, it looks like a star, planets around it. Yeah, one left, okay. Um, but that's, uh, sometimes it's referred to as a star, star schema, sometimes it's called a dimensional model, uh, that's basically it, okay? So uh, when we're building these, uh, we sort of, Kimball in his book, he's got a sort of a design process that he walks through, it's just a four step, very simple process, great way to, if you're meeting internally with your business users or your clients, whoever it is that you're working with to build the data warehouse for, it's a great thing to kind of walk through. First, just identify, it's sort of a top-down approach where you first sort of look at the business and then you drill down into the technology. And so what, what you do is you have to first identify the business process. What is it that I'm actually measuring or trying to measure here? 
And then uh, the next step is to identify the grain. So at what level of detail am I trying to measure that? And then from there, you can identify any relevant dimensions or attributes that can describe that detail. And then also uh, any metrics or KPIs that they're interested in that the business users or leaders are going to be sort of looking for in that business process. Make sense? Okay. Um, and then so, so to kind of conclude all of this, uh, which I don't, I think I'm a little early on time, but that's good. No questions, so, you know, that's fine. Um, too long, didn't read. Uh, so uh, source systems, operational systems, they're not really adequate for analytics. A lot of systems like Salesforce and other uh, tools will sort of have analytics built in, but it's really only going to be for their product or the data that they have in their system. If you want to pull that out and combine it with other data, you've either kind of got to buy into their platform or you got to build your own. And so that's where a data warehouse comes in. And when we're building out that data warehouse, we want to order it into a dimensional model, order it into dimensions and facts, dimensions holding that descriptive, uh, descriptive attributes of, your, of the business entity, and then the facts sort of measuring that business process or those business events. And then uh, lastly, we just want to start with the business process, kind of look at that from the top and work our way down into the technology. And then uh, what else did I say? Oh yeah, so it's good if you can, <laughs> if you're maybe trying to identify multiple business processes um, and then relate those to many dimensions. Uh, they might reuse some of the same dimensions, so it's a good idea to kind of start small first, iterate over you know, some model that you're trying to build out. So that's it. Any questions? Nothing? Yeah. <laughs> no judgment. Something that's not crap. Uh, sure. So, so I guess the if, if you, so, so you kind of. It sounds like you almost had somebody that maybe went rogue, kind of, and built their own, well, built their own analytic solution. Or a situation of just like we're going to build a, a table as we need it, when we need it, and, and just yeah, put a few things in there, and we'll build new. To a lot of different people, a lot of different hands. In the oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I've experienced this before a little bit, in that it was. Um, one big flat table, and everything was thrown into this one big flat table, and it, it, it got really tricky because one, it's, it's one that's not going to scale, it just isn't, right. and then two, it was really wide, and uh, the, you, you couldn't handle multi-valued attributes and things like that, and so in that case, we ended up having to just completely rebuild something else, and you can kind of do this through views of slowly migrating things across. You can create a view maybe that, that hits the original table and then eventually rewrite the query so that it goes to the other table. And you can kind of migrate slowly that way, um, you know. And then I guess to, to add to that, start to start with maybe the highest value thing, let's use the most, and then just kind of iterate, you know, let's chew it up. That's cool. the best answer I can give you on that one. So mostly yeah. burn down, yeah. start again. Uh, in a in a way, yeah. Slowly, slowly, yeah. It's like a smolder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ideally, um, maybe there's parts of it you can salvage and kind of reuse, right? But ideally, right, you want to move towards that dimensional structure. And so the best way you can do that is sometimes just rebuilding it, because sometimes that entire ETL needs to be completely redone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's called snowflaking, where you'll you'll have sort of uh, multi or many tables that sort of create this one dimension. I don't ever find that useful. I don't, I'm not going to say don't ever do it, but um, it, it's it's just because you're just going to end up joining them all together anyway. So why rehash that computing every query when I could just do it once in my ETL, right? So I can either do it once in my ETL and get the benefit on the, the query read read many times, or I can have to reprocess that every single time I go query it. Um, so there's that to consider uh, if you're using uh, the only time I would consider that snowflaking where you have, um, say, the, the a product category is a good example. You could have a product table and then a subcategory and then a category table on top of that. Um, it only really makes sense to use that when you have a, a fact table or a business process that only goes to that level of detail. And so it would relate directly to, say, like a category or in this case, a state. Like maybe you didn't have the, ex the zip code or the actual address of you know, whatever event that took place. Maybe you just have the state. Uh, in that case, you might want to split it out. 
Yeah. So, so let's try to repeat the question. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, I would typically try to put it in the dimensional model somewhere. Usually there's a place for it where you can either, maybe it's its own dimension, maybe it's pretty abstract and you can get your own key for it and put it on that fact table and have it house it there. Because um, that's sort of what you're going to end up doing, right? If you, if you have some table that you're managing that has that data and you need to join fact data to it, you're going to end up joining probably on like some dimension and then joining to this kind of weird rogue table to get your data. And at that point, you've kind of already dimensionalized it. You just haven't put a key on it and put it, maybe put it on the fact or just joined it straight up to the dimension house it there. So I think there would be a way to do that. I'm trying to think of a, an example where maybe that's not the case. but. I would always try to work to put it into the model. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Data warehousing and analytics without the Kimball data warehouse structure, especially nowadays, you know, with all the computing power and big data and all the mm -hmm. out there, I've kind of gotten the impression that the Kimball model isn't necessarily required. Yep, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, so to, just to repeat it, if, if you didn't hear it, uh, so with with kind of the advent of big data, uh, I'll kind of paraphrase and paraphrase and summarize. And if I'm wrong, you can yell at me. Uh, is the data warehouse "quote unquote" dead, or is this modeling practice really even needed with the computing power that we have today? Um, so, in something like a data lake, where you have data lake storage here, you might not actually try to transform it into a dimensional model. Uh, when you get up, if you're doing this kind of of an of a architecture where you're sort of storing data in that data lake and then you're going to use something like a data warehouse, SQL data warehouse or Azure Redshift, Snowflake, um, or analysis services with Power BI, the most optimal way to store that data is to do the Kimball dimensional model. Um, so, so you can get away without doing it and you can probably throw more horsepower at it. That's, cost is going to come with that, right? You're going to be more expensive computing to do that. Um, so for the most sort of bang for your buck, so to speak, uh, that's the approach to take with these, with these solutions. Um, and it also, there's, there's, a, there's sort of a hidden benefit to this as well, where you go through that business process and you conduct interviews with your business users, you're going to learn a lot more about what it is that they're trying to learn in that process than you are actually just putting any technological solution together. Uh, so going through that process has merits of its own where you're going to actually learn a little bit more and get a little more involved with them and you can understand their perspective a little bit more too. So, so there's sort of hidden value in there as well. Sure. Uh, so, so to repeat the question for others uh, and for the recording, uh, so you, similar to the previous question, doing all this modeling is a lot of work, and, and if I'm paraphrasing, so if I'm wrong, you tell me. Uh, it, it, doing this modeling is a lot of work, and you know, the, the people at Tableau say I can just kind of, in a lot of these tools, you can just point to data, pull it in, and get some kind of dashboard pretty quickly on that. And you can do that, and that might be a great way to prototype something out to see is their data valuable in this data set. Um, but it's, I think for, for when you want to do that at scale, uh, it doesn't work. It just, uh, it just starts to slow down. Because again, if you're using, we'll say for the example of Power BI, if you're using Power BI and you're put, pulling data into that system, you're using a tabular model. That's all that is underneath the hood. It's a tabular model. Uh, and so what's going to end up happening is that the best way to store that data is still a dimensional model. Because you're going to take that fact table, it's going to be your biggest table, and you're going to be able to really compress that data size down. And the rest of the data, it'll get compressed too. but. Um, it'll be more compressed in that sense. And so you'll get more sort of bang for your buck out of that. Um, so, yeah, is that adequate? Yes? I think it 
Yeah, in the back. Sorry, I can't hear all the way back there. <laughs> so, like, I've seen a lot of measures are just kind of like calculated at runtime only. They're not stored; they're just calculated at runtime. And that's just mm -hmm. like tabular. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the like? Is it is that part of the Kimball model, or is it just a completely different model? Yeah, no, it's it's part of the Kimball model. So, so in, in tabular, you define metrics, and that's really just a calculation for how do you want to. You have some data set, and what's the math that you want to perform on that data set to aggregate it. Uh, so that's still, I'd say, within the bounds of this. It's that you're, 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 what you're going to end up doing is you're going to reference the, the sort of the measure columns that are in your fact table. Um, so yeah, it's an absolutely valid way to do it. And it's a good way to do it too, just for the, the point that she made. You're going you're gonna to define that metric once and reuse it, and everyone's going to point to that same metric, and you'll have the same definition, so you get the same answer. You don't have this weird, you know, oh, I calculated it this way, I got 42. I calculated it this way, I got 38. So what's the real number, you know? So, yeah. Is there another, another one? Uh, yes. Um, I've, I've seen it be multiple business processes before. There's a, another method that's out there, uh, the Inman model, and that's where you will, uh, what you'll end up doing, you'll, in the same way, you'll bring all your data into one storage, but then you sort of, it's a spoken wheel model, uh, so you'll have that sort of centralized hub, but then you can sort of create small data, what we'll call a data mart, that's just a, same, really just a dimensional model for a particular business unit, and then you'll sort of build off of that. That requires a whole lot of ETL and a whole lot of extra work, it's more simple to uh, put it into the single Kimball model where you have multiple business processes. And the key here really is in the, and I didn't talk about this, but it's in the dimensional, the dimensional tables that are used across business processes. We'll call those conform dimensions in that they conform to multiple business processes. So it might be that you have an employee table that conforms not only to your sales at the register, but also to an HR process where you're trying to measure uh, salary or benefits or something. Uh, it's that same employee table. So, it's, so you can look at those two side by side. And you drill across those business processes, and that's the real a lot so of the value here. Enterprise and say, "This is how we view employees," so that's the same for everybody. And just, yeah, exactly right. Group saying, "I'm going to view employees this way," and "I'm going to view employees this yeah, way." Yeah, that's right. Yep. More questions? I don't. Yes. If you have <coughs> Well, that sounds just like what I mentioned, what I said to him. It sounds like that central dimension that sits between the two is sort of that conformed dimension uh, that, that relates the two together. So it sound, sounds like that's the exact way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Ryan. So we talked a lot about, um, you know, sort of the conceptual longevity and relevance of the Kimball model just from like a procedural standpoint. Are there any, um, you know, products or technologies in terms of the mechanics that you would expect Um, in terms of, you know, some, like, the resources that you might have available to apply certain I'm not sure that I understand the question. So you're saying that um, is the tool going to change such that I wouldn't use a Kimball model? Or is yeah, it going to be so a... so, like, we talked about the Kimball model conceptually, right. you know, has yes. a lot of longevity and relevance, but obviously, you know, the tool kit through what that supply evolves pretty rapidly, perhaps. And so, given the tools that you've laid out in this diagram, is there anything Yeah, a little bit. One thing I didn't really talk about at all in this is uh, streaming. So ha having, uh, say, real-time analytics pipeline. Uh, so if I want to look at, um, you know, how many customers are in my store right now, and I want to be able to look at that trend throughout the day, um, that kind of uh, stuff. There's because with this Kimball model, right? There's a lot of ETL. There's a lot of work to put it in and sort of make it work. And so what happens with the streamlined, the, the real-time analytics? You need to streamline that that ETL process. And maybe you're only going to join out to a few dimensions really quickly and then load it into a small table or, you know, maybe it's, if, uh, Power BI has a thing called streaming data sets and you can load it directly into that data set and it shows up right in the dashboard. 
Um, so that might be a little different where you might not apply as many of these techniques just for the sake of brevity in your ETL process. Um, but that's still uh, what you'll end up doing there if you follow like a lambda architecture. You're going to have another layer where you actually will uh, set that down maybe in a data lake and then go through something like this where you batch it out and you're going to do that more thorough ETL on it because maybe there's more cleansing you want to do to it. You want to dedupe some data or something and then you get a more accurate picture, more historical picture. Yeah. Any other questions? Good questions. Thanks for the discussion at the end. I was afraid there'd be no questions. We would just be done. Um, so I'll hang out for a little bit afterwards if you want to come up and chat. Uh, I, got, I got some business cards up here if, if you want one. Um, so thanks for, for the time and uh, appreciate you coming. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Oh, I was great. I was the best.